going to talk about how uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, Buddhist uh, followers from uh, especially India and China confronted modernity uh, and tried to reform Buddhism uh, to suit the needs of a modern world uh, and some of the various uh, ways they used uh, to propagate Buddhism and reform Buddhism uh, during the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and encountering especially uh, the Second World War, the expansion of the Japanese, uh, and how they tried to find uh, a common uh, path, uh, which is the theme of uh, this panel. Um, this is the, uh, the, the society that I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's called the Mahabodhi Society in Calcutta. This is how it looks today. Uh, it's next to the Theosophical Society. Uh, which was established in South Asia almost at the same time as this institution was, was established. Uh, there are three uh, key issues uh, that I try to address is uh, how after sort of a decline of Buddhism in different parts of Asia, uh, particularly in India uh, and in China, uh, there was uh, an attempt uh, in different parts of Asia, including in Japan, uh, South Asia, and, uh, and in China, uh, to revive Buddhism uh, and address the issue of modernity. The needs of the people had changed, uh, and so uh, these people who were trying to reform Buddhism were trying to address that issue of the needs of the people. Uh, the Mahabodhi Society that I'm going to focus on uh, was at the center of this international movement uh, and an important part of intra-Asian uh, Buddhist connections at this time. Uh, I'll specifically focus on uh, how this institution played a role in connecting India and China, which is my research topic. Um, some of the issues that Buddhism had to deal with at this time, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, is the demands of nation states. This becomes very clear in the case of Republican China, for example, where uh, Buddhism is trying to create an identity for, for itself uh, within a context where there's a need of the nation. Uh, the needs of the society has also changed, uh, and here uh, Buddhism, especially again in Republican China, is trying to come to terms with the needs uh, of the society, uh, and this is something that will then uh, evolve into what we call as engaged Buddhism, uh, that is quite popular in Taiwan, for example. The beginnings of that uh, actually lies in the early 20th century. Uh, a key factor at this time is also interstate war, especially the expansion uh, of the Japanese uh, in the first half of the 20th century. How should Buddhism respond uh, to uh, the issue of warfare uh, is, is very important. Um, now here uh, it should be pointed out initial beginnings of the Buddhism was to leave the society uh, and live in a monastery. Uh, this uh, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century is bringing Buddhism back into the society uh, and, and that relates to the issues of the modern society and, and that's where the modernity part uh, is, is absolutely important. Uh, there are two figures in this movement across uh, Asia at this time. Uh, one is a Sri Lankan called Angarika Dharmapala who was born in Sri Lanka. Uh, he was a co-founder of the Theosophical Society in Sri Lanka. He founded also the Mahabodhi Society, first in Colombo, and then it was moved uh, to Calcutta in 1892. Uh, he was one of the key Asian leaders to participate in the World Parliament of Religions uh, in Chicago in 1893. Uh, he is one of the leading figures to initiate so-called Protestant Buddhism, uh, addressing the issues of uh, the, the, the society at this time. And thus we find the establishment of Buddhist schools, not for Buddhist monks, but the common people of the society, uh, medical clinics, uh, and temples, again, uh, for the common people. So this is a movement away from the early uh, Buddhist institutions and teachings. Uh, a similar figure uh, lived in China, uh, Tai Chi. Um, he is uh, supposed to be the founder of Engaged Buddhism. Um, and he is quite an international figure visiting different parts of the world uh, uh, early on in his life, uh, Japan, Taiwan, and the Malay world. Uh, he was also the founder of a very important magazine or journal, uh, the Hai Chao In, uh, and the founding of those kinds of journals is also something very modern for Buddhism, uh, which basically uses this kind of a medium to address the needs of the common people. 
1923, he established the World Buddhist Federation in, in China. Uh, he was quite involved with the Kuomintang government, uh, meeting with Chiang Kai-shek a number of times. Uh, and through his connections with uh, the Kuomintang, he visited a number of different places. So he was not just a monk, uh, and as I'll show here in this presentation, a very important part of the Kuomintang outreach to other parts uh, of Asia. Uh, and especially in 1939-1940, he leads a goodwill mission uh, to Burma, India, and Ceylon. This is to gather anti-Japanese uh, movement in these regions where uh, Buddhism was initially established. He dies in Shanghai in 1947. These two figures uh, play an important role in creating a new form of Buddhism. Uh, and this is also mentioned in, in, uh, by Tai Chi that what he is trying to do uh, is to create a new Buddhist movement uh, not only for Asia and China, but the entire world. This is something he said uh, in 1928 in, in Paris. Uh, very importantly uh, is this issue about what to do with the Japanese. Uh, at this time in, in China, when everybody is trying to resist the Japanese expansion, should, our, should the Buddhist monks uh, participate in this war of resistance or not? Uh, a huge number of debates take place within the Buddhist community. Uh, and Taishi is one who promotes the idea that Buddhist monks should actually engage in fighting the Japanese, should get military training uh, and, and then fight the Japanese. Uh, but the Kuomintang always complained the Buddhist monks were too weak to actually carry guns and fight. But nonetheless, uh, this was um, of an engaged Buddhism that as a member of the society, you have to defend the society. Again, uh, what Prasenji this morning was uh, saying is this notion of nation state is dictating number of cultural uh, institutions, including the Buddhist in institutions. And this becomes very clear with the example of the Mahabodhi Society uh, that uh, I'm talking about today. Um, so the Mahabodhi Society was founded in 1891 uh, in Colombo, then moves to, uh, to, to India and in Calcutta. Uh, it starts a journal just like Tai Chi does in China. Uh, it emphasizes the principle of ahimsa, uh, nonviolence, but also brotherhood. Uh, this is brotherhood among various communities uh, in India, and, but also different religious communities as well. Uh, one of the key uh, points that the society wants to uh, make is to revive uh, the Mahabodhi temple, which was the most sacred part where the Buddha attained uh, his enlightenment uh, in, in Bodh Gaya to restore from a Hindu, uh, uh, or perhaps, perhaps taken over by the Hindus. We don't know exactly what was happening there, but it was dominated <coughs> by Hindu priests, uh, and he wanted to bring it back into the faults of the Buddhist. Um, the branch of the society was established in different Indian societies and in foreign countries, uh, including Thailand and Singapore. This is a branching out of Buddhist networks, uh, and this is a society, not a monastery. Uh, that is an important thing to keep in mind. It's, it includes lots of lay people. Angarika Dharmapara himself had not converted to uh, Buddhism. He had not become a Buddhist monk. Um, one of the early pictures of the members of the society indicates the highly international membership of the society. They are Japanese, they are Chinese, they are Thai, they are people from different parts of Asia and the world who become members of this society very, very quickly. So this is an international organization that is responding to modernity not only in South Asia but uh, it seems worldwide. Um, some of the key contributions uh, of, of the Mahabodhi Society uh, is uh, the discourse on Buddhism uh, that it tries to in incorporate the intellectuals and not only the monks, not only those who have renounced the society. A translation of the Pali works uh, in Buddhism is a key aspect of it to promote propagate Buddhism again. Uh, a key factor here also of the society is political and diplomatic engagement. This is where uh, it plays a huge role in bringing different states together. Um, promotion of cultural connections, uh, promotion of intra-Asian collaborations, uh, but it does not really take a voice against the Japanese itself. It promotes this kind of engagements, but it doesn't have a view about where the Buddhists should stand with regard to the expansion uh, of the Japanese. 
Uh, the journal uh, is a very important medium to promote the ideas, uh, and it has uh, different kinds of news about what's happening in different parts of the Buddhist world. Um, this is to circulate the information about Buddhism. It was started quite early in 1892. Uh, contributions came from different members uh, of the Buddhist world, different parts of Asia. It included book reviews, a modern journal as such uh, that we see here, that we find in many of the academic journals that we have today. Uh, report of various Buddhist related activities uh, and reports of the work of the Mahabodhi Society and its branches within India and uh, in other parts of uh, Asia as well. It featured, for example, uh, the famous uh, KMT or Koming Tang uh, official Tai Chi Tao's visit to India also in 1940. Uh, tai Chi Tao himself contributed to the journal. Uh, and so there are contributions by the J Chinese translated into English that appear uh, in this journal as well. So it's, it's a very important journal to bring the Buddhist world together through this voice and, and print medium that is, again, an important part of, of this modernity that uh, the Buddhists are encountering and participating in. Uh, the connections to Kuomintang in particular, since this is a presentation in China, it should be mentioned here, uh, the Kuomintang Council General uh, in, the, in the consulate in Calcutta serves as the vice president of the Mahabodhi Society. Uh, Ministry of Information is engaged in uh, interacting with the Mahabodhi Society. Chiang Kai-shek often gives gifts to the Mahabodhi Society in 1942 when he went to India. Uh, he also met with the representatives uh, of uh, the Mahabodhi Society uh, in, in Calcutta. Uh, tai Chi Tao's visit to, uh, to the society in 1940 was a major event. Uh, I have written separately about this, but it's uh, something that he really engages in. He was a Buddhist uh, and took part in various kinds of pilgrimage activities that were organized by the Mahabodhi Society. The connection between uh, him and the society, Tai Chi and the society, were quite deep uh, as well. Uh, after uh, his visit to India, uh, Tai Chi Tao actually writes this. Uh, the connections between India and China, this appears in the Mahabodhi Society Journal. Uh, it is a poem that he dedicates at the very end of uh, his impression of his visit to, uh, to India in 1940. Uh, Taishi in particular is also very involved. He, is, uh, he visited the society in Calcutta, delivered a lecture, which is a very fascinating lecture where he points out now that Buddhism uh, is lost in India, it is time for China to bring Hinduism, uh, Buddhism back to, to India. Um, and, and that's what he promotes in the Mahabodhi Society. Uh, he himself brings gifts from Chiang Kai-shek uh, to, to the Mahabodhi Society. He donated funds, uh, he procured funds from the Chinese people uh, and gave it to the Mahabodhi Society uh, and established on the Mahabodhi Society premises something called uh, International Cultural Religious Center, uh, especially for uh, exchanges between India and China. So he is basically promoting cultural interactions between uh, the two societies. He becomes a patron and life member of the Mahabodhi Society and often wrote in the uh, Mahabodhi Society journal. So information was circulating between the journal in uh, India and his own journal in China. So this is something that, again, Prasanjit mentioned, the circulatory information and exchanges that, that went on was quite clear when we look at the two journals. Um, he donated uh, money and I don't know if it's, uh, to the Mahabodhi Society to establish a building. Um, and, and there is uh, a, a foundation stone that was laid uh, in the Mahabodhi Society that one can see today uh, that he did it on uh, the 10th of July, uh, 1940s. It's still there uh, if you visit it. Now, as a Mahabodhi Society brought in all these people, especially uh, they brought in all the consul generals uh, located in Calcutta. They would often go to the Mahabodhi Society for meetings and events. It was a major site in Calcutta where people from different parts of the world would meet. 
uh, under the auspices of, of Buddhism. Uh, it had particular connections with Sri Lanka. Uh, it had particular connections with Southeast Asia, especially Burma and Singapore. Uh, very deep connections with all the consulates uh, located in Calcutta. Uh, no connections to the Japanese and, and Korean institutions, and this is something I was trying to find out why, uh, and it seems the war does play a role in the 1930s, uh, that the existing uh, connections that they had previously gradually faded away as the Japanese started uh, invading China and Southeast Asia. Um, they did not, although there was a presence of the Chinese community in Calcutta, does not play a role within the Chinese community. It does mostly interstate uh, activities uh, rather than community activities uh, among the people. Uh, I'll end with some of the important issues that I think uh, the Mahabodhist society uh, clearly uh, tells us about modernity and how Buddhism uh, facing these issues about the relevance of a nation state uh, and the importance of, of the civil society uh, tries to deal with. Uh, the first thing Mahabodhi society does is play an important role in inter intra-Asian connections diplomatically and politically, uh, especially with regard to India and China. I think it is one of the leading institutions at this time that promotes cultural uh, and, and uh, religious interactions between the two, two countries. Um, interactions limited uh, to Buddhist monks, uh, selected individuals, but also uh, important officials. So, uh, tai Chi, for example, who comes in as a representative of Kuomintang, Tai Chi Tao, uh, representative of the Chinese government, but there are also officials from Thailand uh, and Burma who are coming in, and the Mahabodhi society plays an important role in connecting them to the local institutions and the local government. Uh, usually people would come in and stay in Calcutta and then move and meet with Nehru uh, in either uh, Allahabad or Varanasi through the Mahabodhi society network. Uh, so that's the link between different states, political organizations, uh, and to the common people becomes an important issue for the Mahabodhi society. Uh, clearly it is, it is uh, apparent from the work of the Mahabodhi society what matters is not just a practice of Buddhism in a monastery, but the engagement with the, with the common people, which is the relevant aspect of, of Buddhism at this time of, of change. Uh, it's, it basically becomes an important means of promoting and reconnecting uh, India and China at this time. So uh, what Prasenji said about Tagore was one aspect. Uh, Mahabodhi society through Buddhism uh, tried to come together with China and address a modernity together, finding a common path uh, to this changed society. Thank you.